How do massive airplanes fly? Some of the largest commercial airliners can weigh over one million pounds. Compare that to today's heaviest flying bird, the Great Bustard, which weighs just around 35 pounds. Despite their differences, these two behemoths rely on the same principles of flight. Flight is basically a battle against Earth's gravity, and your greatest ally is the air. Birds and planes alike fight gravity by manipulating the air molecules around them. When birds flap their wings, they're generating an area of high air pressure under the wing and low air pressure above it. The same happens when planes race down the runway. The pressure difference above and below the wing creates a net upward force, giving the aircraft lift. Once this upward force exceeds gravity's downward pull, you have liftoff. Of course, a one million pound plane needs greater lift to get off the ground than a great bustard. Planes achieve this with a combination of two things. One, airplanes race down the runway at 150 to 180 miles per hour, creating fast moving air across the wings. And two, something called the angle of attack. You probably noticed that planes tilt up at liftoff instead of rising parallel to the ground. The reason is that the tilt, also known as the angle of attack, directs more air below the wing. This increases the pressure and gives the plane an extra boost. But as you fly higher, the air becomes thinner, so the plane must travel faster to maintain that lift. While liftoff speed is around 170 miles per hour at sea level, a commercial airliner's cruising speed is around 550 miles per hour at 40,000 feet, where the air density is 10 times thinner. But a thinner atmosphere means less drag on the aircraft, so the engines can hit high speeds with less fuel. Cruising altitudes between 35 to 40,000 feet are the sweet spot, where pilots can fly as fast as possible while burning the least amount of fuel. Each day, more than two and a half million people in the US hop on a plane, taking to the sky the same way birds have been doing for millennia. Well, there's your science for today. Now you know something. All right, well, listen, I am so grateful for air travel. Praise the Lord. Here you got the Wright brothers, December 17th, 1903. They flew 120 feet in 12 seconds. Yeah. I mean, for those of you actually in this room right now, hello to, by the way, everybody online and everybody at the Pulaski County Jail. We're, you're part of our church. Uh, but if you're in this room right now, that's like twice this, what you're seeing here. 12 seconds. Shh, that's it. And we're like, wow. Now we can fly a million pounds all the way around the world and never stop through in-air refueling. Praise the Lord. Because I love the idea of being able to fly to Florida in two hours instead of drive to Florida in two days. Now, I realize not everybody shares this love of flying like I do. About 33 to 40% have uh, a, a slight anxiety when it comes to flying. I won't ask you to raise your hand if that's anybody here, but somewhere around a third of the people in this room be like, no thanks. Now, another 3 to 7% have the official phobia, aviophobia, and you're like, no. No. But this guy, I got like the opposite of that. Yes, please, fly me. Uh, can't we we, we should have had the flying cars by now, by the way, right? I watched the Jetsons when I was a kid, and I am disappointed. Come on now. Okay, the point is, we're going to talk about this today. Can, can I use this analogy of flight? Because there are, there's these storms in our life that are taking place. All kinds of issues we're going through, different difficulties we have. And God wants us up and over those things. That's what we're going to talk about, how to get up and over those things. Because it's easy to be just burdened down with all the trials and tribulations we find ourselves going through in this life. God's like, hey, I got some way to get you up and over that, and I'm going to teach you that today. We're in a sermon series called From the Inside Out. And this series, we've been going through the book of Romans. This is week number eight. Now, You've heard me talk about the length of our sermon series. Most of the church growth guys say, don't do one past four weeks. Psh, four weeks. We're just getting started. I can't teach nothing in four weeks, right? So, you know, lots of churches have like a Sunday school and a church. and a, We just do all that like at the same time. Here, you're welcome to Sunday school. Little stickers on your sticker chart for you today. 
as we go through Romans chapter 8. We've, we've seen sin. We've been talking a lot about sin and what it does, what it doesn't do, what it means. And now we're going from like sin, we're going to some of the answers. And they're found in Christ. They're found in us being in Christ. And that's really what we're going to focus on here today. That's why it's called from the inside out. Most people have a totally wrong understanding of religion, church. They think, i got to change all these things. I can't tell you how many times someone's told me, I can't come to church because if I do, the place is going to fall in because I'm so messed up and I'm, well, you'll fit right in here. <laughs> fall in. We'll be like, I know you. Right? Be- why? Because you know what? It's not the outside changes from our hands. It's not the actions. It's from our heart that God transforms our heart and from our heart come the right actions. Yes, the actions do change, but why do they change? How do they change? They change from the inside out, from the heart. And Jesus specializes in transforming our heart. And that's what the book of Romans is about. And that's what we've been going through. So we're going to start in Romans chapter 8 today, starting in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, stop right there. No condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. A famous verse, a beautiful verse. Something that if you're going to memorize one, this is the one for the week. No condemnation. We're going to dig into that a lot in this message. Because, why is there no condemnation? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, capital S, who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We're going to talk about these two different laws here today. The law of the Spirit that gives life and the law of sin and death. These are laws that are in operation in the world today. Those who live according to the flesh, uh uh-oh, they have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Now, the way this is kind of phrased, if you think about it kind of reversed, if you have your mind set on the flesh, you're going to do those things. You got your mind set on the Spirit, you're going to do those things. So it's where you're set in your mind. Where your mind goes, everything else is going to follow. See, the mind governed, led, overseen by the flesh is death. So when we start thinking that, what's going to end up being death to, uh, well, literal death in one point in time, at least one point in time, but a spiritual death. But the mind governed by the Spirit, the mind led by the Spirit is life and peace. See, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. <laughs> you know, it doesn't like, that when our minds are filled with sinful things, it's, not, it's a war with God. It doesn't submit to God. It doesn't want to do that, nor can it do so. But those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. When we're living like that, when we've got our minds set on those things, that's not pleasing to God. That's not the way God intended us to live. You guys are all like, that's a lot today. Oh, we're just getting started. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Okay, I like this because he's saying, listen, your identity is in Jesus, right? Okay, let's try it again now. Uh, Your identity is in Jesus, right? Yeah, if if that's the case, then we're, we're the ones living by the Spirit. We're the ones putting our mind on the Spirit, at least daily trying to steer our lives God's direction and not our own direction. And he goes on to say, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body's subject to death, I mean, we're all falling apart. At least that's what it feels like to me. Because of sin, the Spirit, though, gives life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. The same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead after three days in that tomb is the same one living inside of us, and he's the one who broke Jesus up out of that tomb, and he's going to break us up out of the situations we found ourselves in. See, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Okay, a lot here. I want to break this down, start with this idea right here. When we live in Jesus, we live free from condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Living in Jesus is free from condemnation. First, let's talk about what this big spiritual word condemnation is. All right, you may have heard of this before. Like, I don't even know what that is. Well, it's like a court. It, it's a, the understanding is like a court, a gavel coming down. The judge has said you're guilty. 
you're guilty. Now, when we studied Romans chapter 1 and 2, we found that, yes, we have all sinned. Yes, we are all guilty. So the gavel did come down, and it said guilty. Here's the, here's the angle. Yes, we're, we've all sinned. I remember being real mad at Adam and Eve, right? You guys been mad at Adam and Eve for blowing it for all humanity? Then I thought, well, how am I doing? I mean, guys, if I was Adam, I wouldn't have made it as long as he did, right? I mean, a beautiful woman gives you food. You're going to eat that, guys. You do the same thing. Right, so I mean, the point is, oh, we're so frustrated with Adam. Adam's living within us. We are all guilty of this very same sinfulness, this very same selfishness. That we're, we're, we're guilty of the same things. So we are condemned, yet no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the key. Outside of Jesus, yeah. Now, the last thing Jesus said on the, on the cross was, Tetelestai, uh, it is finished, the Greek word tetelestai. It means paid in full. It'd be like someone taking all your bills and just paying all your bills. Oh, now he's preaching. So he just sneaks in your house, finds all your bills, and secretly behind your back pays all your bills. And you all caught up and you have no debt. You're totally free from all debt. That would be a beautiful moment. That is Tetelestai. He said, I, with my own death, I have paid the very debt that's been owed for humanity for the sin of humanity. That's why in Christ Jesus, when we're in him, we get Tetelestai. Now outside of him, yeah, condemnation's going to happen. Some people try to say, oh, that, that preacher, he's preaching condemnation. Well, hold on a second. Let me explain what this means. Yes, there are some preachers or pastors who do that. I, the, the, the thing is, you can preach strong. You can expose sin. Goodness gracious, look at Paul's own writings to the other churches. Look at Peter's uh, the books. I mean, when they wrote their letters to those churches, those were sermons they were writing. Those were filled with, hey, y'all need to stop it. Lots of stop it. But it's not condemnation because you always point to the answer of Jesus. In other words, condemnation preaching is y'all are messed up and there's nothing that can be done about it. Y'all are broken, but you're just going to be like that. So it's who you are, it's who you're always going to be. Condemnate, that's condemnation. Now, life-giving preaching is, guys, here's the exposed problem. This is a reality. But when we put our hearts and lives in Jesus, he can transform all of that, and we can break free from the chains that we're living under. See, that's the life-giving thing. It's not the exposing of him that makes it wrong. It's not giving the answer in Christ. We clear? Okay, back to our air analogy. Let's talk about the law of gravity versus the law of lift. You've got this gravity pulling down, and you've got lift pulling up. By the way, this is a law, right? A, the law of gravity. We got here this big meteorite. By the way, I learned yesterday the difference between an asteroid and a meteorite. This big rock right here, I think it's like a couple hundred pounds. This is a meteorite because it's come through the atmosphere. Asteroids are still beyond Earth's atmosphere. Meteorites are. And that is two sciences in one message. Yeah, we are a smart church, right? Well, thanks, Heath. Yeah, I didn't even care to know that, but here I am. Okay, so this meteorite right here, we got this on loan from uh, Ancilla College. This, we used it for yesterday's kids, God's Galaxy kids stuff. Yes, you can touch the meteorite after church. I know you want to. I know I wanted to. It's very cool. It's very heavy. Um, okay, the point is, you take this meteorite anywhere in the world, and you let, if you can pick it up, if you let go of it, it's going to fall. It falls in New Zealand. It falls in Winnemac. It falls no matter where you live or no matter where you are because it's the law of gravity. That's how it works. It's a law. Now, there is a law of lift, which means I could put this rock inside the plane, and I can fly this rock and get it off the ground. I can overcome the law of gravity with the law of lift. Still tracking with me? See, the, the illustration is this. We are being pulled down by the weights of our own sins all the time. It is working against us. Our flesh, the enemy, I mean, it's just working. It's pulling us down all the time. And, and you can feel the weight of it in this dark world that we live in. 
the temptations of it. But the key is we can overcome the law of gravity and the law of sin and death by the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. When we put our lives in Christ, live our lives in Christ, surrender every part of who we are to Jesus, we are now in his airplane, we are in Christ, he's the airplane, we're in Christ, and that's how we get up over the situation. In our own power, we have very little power to get up off the ground. I mean, you can flap your wings, you go, you go get the cardio, but you're not going to get off the ground. I mean, we're, it's just a, a pathetic example of trying to change ourselves. It's not going to work. But we can be in Christ. And in Christ, the next thing you know, miraculous things are taking place because only in Jesus do we overcome the weight that's pulling us down constantly about our own sin. This is Brock Purdy. You ever heard of him? He's the San Francisco quarterback. Uh, there's a cool story about his testimony. Now, Brock, for those of you that were like not into the science thing, this is for you, by the way. Welcome back to the sermon. Let's talk some sports. Brock uh, was played for Iowa, uh, Iowa State. Iowa State? Yeah, Iowa State. Cyclones. And he was drafted in the NFL. The problem is, this was last year, he was drafted in the NFL. The problem is he was drafted number 262 out of 262. Yeah, they have a special title for this person that's drafted 262 out of 262. It's called Mr. Irrelevant. Oh, I know. I heard that over here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, basically, if you're 262 out of 262, you, you're not even going to make the team. It's like, here you go. I guess you're on a team. You can be a human tackling dummy and see if you survive that. There you go. There, you're in the NFL. He was third string quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Well, through a series of events, he finds himself in the starting position. He ends up learning a whole bunch. Not only that, he takes his team five wins in a row all the way to the NFC Championship game. Now, he did play in the Super Bowl. He lost, but that's not part of this testimony. Forget about the loss. Okay, but Brock, he's a Christian. Brock Purdy's a Christian. There in college, he, was, he, had, he, had, a, he had a moment with God in college. Because he, you know, to be even in a, as a college starting quarterback, you know, you got to just put everything you've got into that. You got classes and you got, you got practice and all that. And he had made football his whole life. He had totally focused on it to the point where it was his whole life. And God said, I want you to surrender this to me. I want you to put me at the center of your identity instead of football at the center of your identity. And Brock Purdy said, all right, I'll make you. And he goes on to testify, the next day I didn't throw for 500 yards and seven touchdowns. I didn't see an immediate change. But what I did decide was, no matter what happens, I'm going to let Jesus have control. I'm going to let Jesus be the center, and I'm going to make it about him and my identity in him, in him, remember that, that's going to make the difference. Well, now look at, look at what God has done, right? God gives him a little opportunity. And if you've ever heard any of his testimonies, it's definitely worth Googling. Uh, it's all about Jesus, and it's about what Jesus has done in his life. But see, Brock Purdy went from being about inside of him to being outside. It went from about football and me and all the things I can accomplish to being, all right, I'm going to put my identity in Jesus. And then you notice as soon as he does that, bam. Mr. Irrelevant becomes pretty much one of the highest, going to be one of the highest paid quarterbacks in the next couple of years. How? Because he found himself in Christ. See, he changed his angle of attack, and we need to change our angle of attack. We have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. I got my little plane here. You got to put the plane's nose up. You got to bring the plane's nose up. The angle of attack can no longer be looking at ourselves and our own situations, our own selfishness, our own that we got to get our nose up. Stop looking inward and start looking upward. Man, this is hard to do in today's society, guys. It's easy to make it about us. It's even easy to make it subtly about us. Now you got those wildfires in Texas right now, burning millions of acres and everything and you know, Christians are funny. It's like, hey, pray that my barn doesn't burn down and my, pray that my field doesn't burn. And Okay, I mean, that's worth praying for, but how about we pray that nobody's barn burns down? 
you know, that guy over there, too bad for him, but pray that my barn doesn't burn down. Everybody else is who's losing all that stuff. I mean, that's too bad for them. But what about me and my silos? And see, we can, if you're not careful, we'll even make the thing that's supposed to be upward, we'll still even make it inward. Whole churches built upon self-thought and self-centeredness and making it about you. Listen, yes, I'm trying to help you today, but this church is not about you. It's about transforming you into the weapon that God wants you to be so you can go out into the world and make a difference. So yes, that's what's happening here. To a degree, it's about you, only so that we can have stuff torn off of us and stuff put into us so we can accomplish what God has put us on the planet to do. That's why we're always going to stretch you here. You're, you can feel it, right? Every single week we stretch you. We got, we're asking you to do stuff. We're at, we, that's, that's on purpose. Because we all, guys, we got to change our angle of attack. We cannot overcome the weight of the law of sin and death unless we change our angle of attack and start looking to Christ and putting our whole life in Christ. Amen. So, yes, I, I pray that each one of us gets something today. But we've got to, even for our whole church, we've got Easter coming up. We've got to make this about inviting somebody to Easter so we can help everybody take a step closer to Jesus. Man, I, I, let me tell you, I'm working on the Easter message right now. It's pretty boring. Yeah, it's a pretty boring message. It's, there's not going to be any, let me tell you, there's not going to be anything shocking in this year's Easter message. But if you bring someone who doesn't know Jesus, they're going to understand the gospel message like they've never understood it before. It's going to be clear. It's going to be written out. And you might not get much out of it and be like, that was it. But that person that you brought would be like, that was mind-altering, clear information that I can grab a hold of and change my life. Because we got to change our anger will attack, guys. Okay, once we do that, guess what? We can hit cruising altitude. Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify, fulfill the desires of the flesh. God's got a plan, and the plan for us is cruising altitude, where we are burning the least amount of energy and going the fastest. Cruising altitude. Now, this scripture here in Galatians 5, Galatians 5 has a lot of similarity between Romans 8 and Galatians 5. The word walk here is parapatio, and it doesn't, patio means walk, para means where you're walking. And it doesn't mean just to walk around. So, I mean, it's, I hate to tell you this, but the English language is, is, is kind of a dumb language. Like, I'm sorry. It's not very expressive. I know it's the only one you and I know. But the word walk here is actually, man, it is so much deeper than just walk. Because it means you've walked in an area so much that you got it deep in your heart. It's memorized. I walk this walking path too, not too far from my house. And I, I walk it pretty much every day. I go down and I come back pretty much the same, the same stretch of, I got this thing memorized. Now, I don't want to do a blindfolded, don't put me to the test. There's a lot of those little yellow poles that stick up halfway through. Could be bad. But I know that spot. I walk that spot. I, it's, like, it's like automatic memory. That's what it means to walk by the Spirit. We have obeyed God over and over and over again. And we've done it so many times. Guys, we've obeyed God so many times, it just comes natural to obey God. It's not natural to disobey God. It's natural to obey God. That's the cruising altitude that God's called us to live at. Where we're up here. And it's like, of course I'm going to serve the Lord. Now, believe me, the, the gravity, the weight of the sin is still pulling on us, guys. It never stops pulling on us. It's the law of sin and death. But we can get to a place where we are just cruising up and over that, and we're like, all right, I'm, just, I'm obeying God. I do the right thing. We do the right thing. It's easy to do the right thing. You see, when we walk with God in those hard times, and we walk with God in the good times, and we walk with God in the hard times, when the next hard time comes, we're so used to walking with him that we're just at cruising altitude. We're like, man, that's a setback. I'm not super thrilled about that. But yet, Jesus, you're going to be with me hand in hand, right? You're going to be with me all through this, right? Because you were this time and that time and that time and that time. Since you were with me all these times, I know you're going to be with me this next time. That's parapatio. 
And when we do that, see, by the Spirit, we don't gratify the desires of the flesh. We don't even care about those other things because we're, 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 we're powered by lift. We're up and over those storms instead of down and underneath them. Guys, it's really a miracle. Overcoming gravity feels like a miracle. I do like flying, but the idea that this piece of machinery has 20-something to whoever many thousand moving parts, and if one of those doesn't work right, we fall out of the sky at 40,000 feet, not 25 feet. I, that's pretty much a miracle, right? Now, Pastor Glenn, you were the head of maintenance. Please assure us all that you guys really cared about that stuff. Okay. He was the head of maintenance at Delta and some other ones. Okay, you, you guys are on it and stuff. No one's napping over there or something. Okay. That one, one Friday about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, man. Never mind that, right? It, it's a miracle. What, why, why am I talking about this? Because, guys, when we get to this place where we're following the Lord like that, it's pretty much a miracle. It's like every day is a supernatural day, but it's a natural day. We're just naturally supernatural. A friend of mine preached the sermon series called that in Michigan. Naturally supernatural. We're just supernatural all the time. It's coming from us. And you know what? When we, when we can get to this place, this is the place God's got for us. When we can get to this place, it never gets old. God's just with us. God's with us. Stuff's happening. It's drawing us down, but we're, okay, I'm going to get up over the top of that. Supernatural things coming from us, not because we're acting weird, but because it's just naturally supernatural. This is how God works in our hearts and lives. I've been thinking about, I had a staff meeting uh, last Wednesday, and I've been thinking we were talking in the staff meeting about how God works. And in the staff meeting, we were talking about particularly the season that we're in right now, in, in our church, it's a, it's a beautiful season. People coming, people turning their life to Christ. We went around the table in all the different locations of Heartland and talked about these various miracles that we've been seeing taking place, you know. And it's not like tent revival miracles. It's just people praying with other people, talking with other people. It's just naturally supernatural. And then I realized we have a lot of moments in our life, don't we, guys, that they're supernatural moments, and we don't even realize how precious they are because in the moment, we don't realize how precious they are until we're past that moment. Think of back when my kids were younger. I had some really great times with those kids. I mean, by the way, they're, they're doing fine. I'm just saying back when they were younger, you know, that was cool. <laughs> now they're old and one's a teenager, so you know how that goes. You got little kids. It's so easy when you have little kids to be thinking like, man, I wish this kid would grow up and do this and that. Please embrace that moment because you're going to look back on that moment with a lot of, uh, uh, in your heart, with a lot of thankfulness and gratefulness. And I'm telling you right now, in many, I know your stories, most of your stories, God's really doing something right now. And I would hate for us to be so moving past this moment to not realize the beautiful moment God has given us right here, right now, today. So wanting the future moment that we miss the one that God's got for us right here, right now. As a church, it's a beautiful moment. For our families, it's a beautiful moment. Even, even some of you going through some difficult times, like, man, Heath, come on. Yeah, but don't you feel God carrying you in that beautiful moment? God's taking that test, and he's about to make a money. You're going to make a money out of your test, your test and a testimony, Right? Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, what's, why is this going on? We may look back at that and say, that was one of my greatest moments because I really saw God move in the depths of my situation. See, that's the miracle of being in the Spirit every day, in His plane. Not in our, not in our strength, in His strength every day. Looking out the window just thinking, wow, God, look at what you're doing. So how do we apply this? We adjust your angle of attack and look up. And obey God over and over again until it becomes your new cruising altitude. So first off, we got to adjust our angle of attack. We cannot be those that are just focused on us. we got to be those that are looking up to Jesus. Saying, God, everything I need is found in you. Everything I want is found in you. Every, uh, every power, it's all found in you. See, once we adjust that angle of attack, that's how we get off the ground. 
And if we continue to look like this with our eyes inward, we're, we're, we're going to struggle in the, the law of sin and death is just going to pull down on us and we never quite get up and over it. The key to the first step of getting up and over it is right there, getting that angle of attack right. And then whew, off we go. And then number two, you start obeying God. What did God tell you to do? What was the last thing God told you to do? Maybe God told you to have a conversation with someone and apologize. And we were like, no. And God's like, yeah, go back and do that. And we just keep thinking that if we just keep walking on, he'll like change his mind about what he said back there. That's not how God works. And if we stop and listen to his spirit, we'll go, all right, I'll have that conversation and I'll tell them I'm sorry for what I did. You see, once we get into the place of obeying God, it becomes a place where, where we're up and over. We're in this cruising altitude. We obey him. We listen to his voice over and over again. It becomes our, our, uh, our, our parapatio, the place where we've walked it so many times. It becomes natural to us. If I could have every head bowed, please, and every eye closed. Lord, right now, I just pray for everyone watching or listening to this message right now that they are free from condemnation, that if they've walked in condemnation, whether that's from, uh, from the enemy, from Satan putting those condemning thoughts in our heads and our hearts, or it's from other people who know our past and the mistakes we made, or if it's from us ourselves, sometimes we're our worst critic looking in the mirror and, and hating what we see looking back at us. I pray that we get our eyes from looking down to looking up and, and have our focus on what Jesus sees. And he sees us and, and there's no condemnation. And I pray that you help that spirit to be there. And I pray you also help us in that same light to not condemn others. <clears throat> we are not the Holy Spirit. It is not our job to judge. It is our job to be faithful over what you've given us to be faithful over. And it's not our job to look at anybody with condemnation. I pray you help us to repent of any of those instances in our life and i pray lord that you just help us to to walk in obedience to your spirit to walk in that obedience over and over and over until we become naturally supernatural that it is our default is to walk in the spirit and to obey what your word says and what you tell us to do in our daily lives in times of prayer or just times of just hearing you bubble up in our spirit to our mind and giving us instructions to obey that as if it was headline news and it was more reliable. And I pray, Lord, help us to look past the struggles, to understand that we don't walk in the law of sin and death anymore, but we walk in the spirit. We don't fulfill the laws and the lust of the flesh. We don't fulfill those desires. We just trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.